Hi, Fergus. How are you doing? You okay? Very good, thank you. And you? Yeah, not bad. I'm just going to share my screen because I'd quite like um, just to. I've just I've just made a fashion error, haven't I? I've put a check shirt on and it's clashing with the screen. Oh so uh, I'm going to do my own magic eye type uh, appearance later. Thank goodness for the slides. <laughs> what day we have spring has sprung and dealing with change. We're all facing an enormous change coming out of our uh, respective and restrictive uh, lockdowns, moving towards getting back out into the world. And the timing couldn't be better for the content that we have for you today. Uh, we have Colin McLaughlin, who's the former ex-SAS um, man who's going to give us some real world insight into his amazing experiences, more of which in a minute. And we have uh, Gosia Gorner, who's an international coach and really understands uh, how to transform fear into brilliance. Wrapping it all up at the end, um, I'm going to attempt to deliver forgiveness within 30 minutes, which is an interesting concept when we are looking at change because it's something that can keep us stuck in the past when we fail to recognize or to forgive. As Jeremy has said, we welcome questions uh, via the uh, messaging function, which Jeremy is in control of. And uh, right on the button of um, five minutes past three, I would like to introduce Colin McLaughlin, um, who has an amazing uh, life and experience to share with you and some real world insights that you can transform into your business uh, directly. So hello and welcome to Colin and look forward to what he has to share with us and your questions. Goodbye for now. Thanks very much. Uh, that was a, a very nice introduction there. And for some of you, I've probably um, met, and for others, perhaps, perhaps not. But um, so, apologies if you've seen perhaps some of these uh, some of these initial slides. But if I can uh, share my screen, I can share the presentation with you. Just, uh, waiting I, for I, the host your, uh, to let me. Share with me a sec. I, I had your screen up. I don't know whether you saw it, but um, there you go. You can uh, you can now share your screen. There we are. Perfect. Okay. Hopefully you can see that. I'll bring up my presentation. Okay, so pleasure to be here, albeit virtually, and that's sort of the way we're doing things at the, at the minute. And um, I've met some of you before and some of you, obviously, uh, this is the first time. So I thought it might be useful to uh, go through things by way of an introduction into, uh, into me uh, and learn about some of my experiences that I've had along the way through various adventures. So that sort of fear of the unknown um, which sometimes we have, you know, and we're sort of in one of those moments now where we're in this sort of hopefully the, the back end of this sort of COVID journey we've been on um, coming out of lockdown, more people having the vaccines. And so there's a little bit of sort of hope there in terms of what we're what we're going through. I talk a little bit about bravery and fear. Um, never really class myself as a, as a brave person, but um, how, how we manage fear, how we deal with that and use it to our advantage and get the best possible sort of success out of that and the best versions of ourselves for what we want to do. Sometimes that part of that bravery and that fear is just considering the consequences of our actions, which sometimes I use as a little gauge into sort of the if I'm ever at one of those problem points, what I should or shouldn't do. And then hopefully there'll be a chance to, to answer questions at the end. So if you do have them, pop them in the, the, the chat box or direct them towards Jeremy and we can, we can answer that at the end. Who am I? For some people, they might have heard this before. Or they might know who I am. But whenever I try and describe who I am, I always talk about a day I was locked in a, a room. I was, it was locked from the outside. I couldn't get out. And I was quite badly beaten. I was inside, I had a fractured uh, eye socket. I couldn't see out my right eye. And there was, a, there was a small window up in the corner 
And every time I went up to try and see out the out the window, a guy would come in from the outside and, and do me in again. And this went on for a few days. My meals were brought in on trays and stuff. And whenever I tell people that, they say, well, you know, you're trained for that in the SAS, trained to withstand that. But actually, the, the, the opposite's true. I, um, I was only 12, 13 years old. But this would trade me up for a career in the military and later on special forces because... From an early age, I could see that there was, I had these two sides. I had this mental side and this physical side. And physically, I could get broken down. You, you punch me or, or whatever, I'll, I'll, I'll bleed, my bones will break. But mentally, I sort of decided where I was. I always talk about being the gatekeeper of my emotion. And you couldn't make me scared or angry or sad or happy. Only I had control over that. I decided what happened with that. And I held the key that decided which way I was going to be. And you could try and influence it. You could try and make me turn the key in a certain direction. But it was always me turning the key. And that would always help me later on in life when it come to various things I was, I was going through. And I knew that yesterday I was battered and I'm still here today. And maybe today I'd be battered, but I'd still be here tomorrow. And eventually I'd be old enough, I'd be able to, to leave the house. And, and that's exactly what, what happened. I like this quote up here. This is my school photograph. And I like this quote from Alder that says, your perspective in life comes from the cage you were held captive in. You'd be glad to know I wasn't held captive in a cage or anything. And I always think that the glasses through which we see the world, what gives us our perspective in life, our values, is formed by everything immediately around us. So as we grow up, that's our, our childhood, our family unit. And we go through school and work and we see things in television, we read them in magazines. And that's what sort of gives us all our, our good and bad and right and wrong. And we throw that in a pot and that gives us our perspective, how we see the world. But it's only as good as the perspective we have. It's only as good as the environment we've been subjected to. And so our perspective can change depending on our, our, our environment. I wonder how many people's perspective will change coming out the back of COVID in terms of things they can do with their spare time, things that they might hold more valuable now than they might have taken for granted in the past things that are, are valuable to them. But it's only, it's that perspective and certainly COVID has given us a, a different perspective. I put NSPCC up there because I do a lot of work with, uh, with children that have come through similar sort of uh, childhoods. I was a soldier at 15. I had to get special permission to join the army. You had to be 16 to join the military. And my mum had to write me a letter to say, uh, Colin has to join the army at 15, otherwise he's going to end up in a home or he's going to be homeless. And so the, the army sort of welcomed me and I was glad for that. And that was the last time that I saw my parents. And this became my sort of second family or my first real family because the people left and right of me cared about my physical and mental well-being. We, we realised that as, as, a, as a single soldier, we remember we weren't that great, but as a unit, we were sort of far greater than the sum of our parts. And if we all pulled together, we were capable of sort of great things. So it was something I grew to embrace. It wasn't my normal environment, but I decided for early on that I was going to make a, a career of it. This was army life. You know, it wasn't all spent topless. I just like putting some of these pictures in there, but I quite enjoyed my, my time in, in, in the army. And a lot of our time early doors in the Green Army, as we call it, was spent in Northern Ireland. And Northern Ireland was a great training ground for the, the military because at the centre of the conflict was people. It wasn't about religious ideology or politics or whatever. It was people. We were passing people in the street and asking them, what's going on? What, what, you know, what are your concerns? What, 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 what are the things going on in your everyday life? And that sort of hearts and minds approach would stand us in good stead later on. We went to places like the Balkans and Sierra Leone, Afghanistan, Iraq, where there's this sort of tribal family culture. It's people that are at the heart of it. And you can have all the weapon systems you like in the world. You can have a great military. But unless you can shift mindsets, then, you, you know, you're up against it. And places like Afghanistan have showed that. The top picture you see there is the Queen's Butcher. Not many people know I was the Queen's Butcher. But I spent a lot of time at Balmoral uh, on the estate and I was just left in there on, on my own and the, the Queen would just come in and out with her, with her corgis and shoot the breeze. Very surreal for me as a sort of young 19, 20 year old boy, you know, and 
I, I, this was before the time of Insta twat and face gram, so I wasn't running about trying to find a, a device and take a picture and a selfie with the Queen, and I'm quite glad I didn't, because sometimes I think we can be guilty of that nowadays. We, we're desperate to capture it on a device rather than use our senses. So one thing COVID's given us a great idea of our senses, because we've all managed to get out and about and do our walks and see the environment, hear the birds again. And for the first time I was driving in the car the other day, and I had that, and I don't think I've had this for about 10, 15 years. I had to do the 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 wind the wipers on the windscreen because it was all full of the little flies that were splatting all over the windscreen. And I thought, I don't remember that happening over the last sort of decade. And I wonder whether there's something in that that our environment's changed because of, of COVID and how much less pollution and stuff there is. It was a great time for me, though. I got, I got to dance with Lady Diana at the Gillies Ball, meet the Queen and the Royal Family and stuff. And that was back in the days when there wasn't a public and a, a private profile of the royal family. Now, you know, everything's sort of open to the TV sets, but it was a very privileged position and, and it's part of our DNA. You know, our experiences make us. The bottom one is Edinburgh Castle and that sort of uh, public duties, you know, and uh, I enjoyed that as well. And I remember hiding in a bush in Northern Ireland. It was about four o'clock in the morning with a couple of other guys. And um, it was in my army time. It wasn't in, in my spare time or anything. You'd be, you'd be glad to know. But these two doll, tall, dark, bearded, handsome strangers crawled in and said, right, kid, we'll take it from here. We're, we're the SES. And I thought, all right, there's, a, there's another level here. There's like a Premier League going on. And I wanted to be part of that because I was a good soldier in the regiment I was in. But that was my only environment. That was my perspective. And I wanted to see what it was like in the grand scheme of things. So I put my papers in for SCS selection without really knowing what, was, what it was about. Selection runs twice a year, and it, it has the best of all the sort of Army, Navy, REF, territorials, and from last year, women that, that are in the military. And we want that. We want very different people to make up our Special Forces teams. And when I walked in on day one in the cookhouse, there was 196 people on my selection, nearly 200. And as I looked around, there was people far bigger, far stronger, far fitter and faster than me. And I thought one of the things I did very early on was to say, I'm not gonna measure myself against anybody else. Because I, th I think sometimes when you measure yourself against somebody, there's a chance you might come up short. One of the early things I did was decide that I I'm, I'm just gonna do the best I can do. And that's gonna be the measure, that's my template. And I think that's important for everybody that we don't try and measure ourselves against the manager, somebody we aspire to, a friend, somebody we see on social media, because that's not us. And that's a we, we get an image of something that perhaps isn't isn't realistic. So we want to, to measure ourselves against something measurable and real. And that's us. And we're the best measure. We're the best template we can have. So I always said that and always had goals. My goal was just to get to the next day. Selection six months long. And my, my goals were always just to get to the next day. And I was never at the front of selection. I was never at the back. I was just somewhere in the middle, just trying to survive and get by, get to the next day. It just so happened that the, at the start, there was 196. And at the end, there was 12. But I still felt I was in the middle. I was just trying to survive, just trying to hide, get to the next day. And um, uh, But that was good enough. And at the end of it, this is me at the end of selection next to our famous clock tower. And our clock tower has the names of, of all the men we've ever lost in the SAS along the side of it. And it's a poignant reminder of why we're there and what we're doing um, and, and why we're doing what we do. And there's a famous uh, poem, James Elroy Flecker at, at the side there. I talk about staying the course. And we're in that at the minute, we're in this sort of COVID journey and it looks like we're coming out the back of it. We've just got to stay. And for a lot of people, the hardest, yards are the last yards that last bit where you just need to get over the line and for a lot of people this will be the most difficult time and whether you're climbing up Everest or whether you're running a marathon at times it's just about putting one foot in front of the other and just keep going and you'll get there you'll get to the finish line because sometimes those are the hardest yards and people will be feeling it right now they'll be feeling that last little bit that's the hardest to get through you got to visualize the end goal. What is it? What is it you're trying to do? Define success. What does that mean? And for us, we'll all have our different goals. We'll all have different things that define success for us. So it's important to remember it and stick to it. And we'll get where we need to be. 
but goals will get us there. Whether they're small term, medium term or long term, we make them, we tick them off and eventually we get where we need to be. And that's the same for anything. You're training for a run or something or you're trying to lose weight. We set those little goals and that just ticks us away to get where we need to be. And of course, I've always just tried to learn from people around me, make myself valuable. And every day is always a school day for me. Not long after I passed selections, one of, one of my first jobs, I was still quite young. I was only 23 on selection for the SES. I was one of the youngest there. And I was probably only about 24 by this time. And I got sent away to the Balkans. And we had a, a massive task. It was to lift 161 war criminals from, from the Balkans. And it was, a it was a mammoth task. And sometimes when you have tasks that big, it's about setting priorities and goals and allocating time for it. So we started off with the sort of highest ranking ones that were the most important, set a time, made a plan, and then sort of ticked it off. This particular one's called Operation Tango. And when I was sent away on it, one of my jobs was to, um, it was a cutoff because I was a new guy. So they didn't really want me involved in the heart of it. They wanted me across somewhere doing a, a sort of what they would deem a sort of lower task job. So my task was to go to the back of the, the lake and just do commentary. I had an earpiece and a pistol, and that's all I had. And this particular guy, Simo Dralakia, he was one of the um, targets. And we did a sort of pattern of life on him and discovered that the best time to lift him was when he went out fishing. He went out on a lake and we only had two bodyguards with him. And it was the best time to try and put an arrest on him. And our priority was always to try and arrest them. We wanted to arrest them and bring them in to go through the proper uh, judicial system. But if we couldn't, and as a last resort, we, 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 we would have to take them down. Um, and so we put into this sort of planning phase and the rest of the guys were on the other side of the lake because he always went to the lake, came on, did his fishing and then went off. So they put me on the other side just in case and they put a cut off in the woods and everybody else was on the other side of the lake. So I was sitting there doing my commentary in my little shell suit with my little um, sort of paper bag dressed up as a, a sort of drinker on a bench. And the boat started to come towards me. And I thought, that's weird. He doesn't normally come this way. So I sent it over in the commentary and told everybody. And they said, don't worry. He always comes this way. Just stay where you are. And I thought, OK. And I'm starting to get a bit worried now because he looked like he was going to start coming off the boat. And on my side, just said, Guys, I'm a little bit worried here. It looks like he's he, he might be coming this side. And they said, nah, he never comes that side. Stay where you are and we'll get him when he comes. So anyway, he then docks the, the boat and as luck would have it, him and both his bodyguards jump off on my side. So they're probably about 200 meters away. And I'm thinking, this isn't good. So I get on the radio and I say, guys, that's, that's him. He's, he's come off this side and he's coming towards me. And they're like, right, okay. Um, we're coming round there, but if he gets to you, put a hard arrest in. And I was thinking, what? Put a hard arrest in? I was only about 24 years old. I was thinking, I've not been here that long. How am I going to put a hard arrest in? Where are you guys? And sometimes life's like that. It just takes you and just drops you right in at the deep end. And we're almost in one of those sort of places at the minute where we're in a, we're in a place we're not familiar with. We don't know when the end's at sight. We don't know how it's going to turn out but we've just got to see it through. We've got to be brave. And for me, I was never, was never a brave person, but I always thought about the consequences of things, whether I did them or not. So I thought, right, okay, I'm just going to have to go with this and see what happens. So I get up and I stagger about, sort of kidding on, I'm, I'm drunk. And these three guys come towards me. All three of them are armed. And one of them in particular has an AK-47, so it has far longer range than me. And I'm always worried that that's my priority. And I only had a pistol and I only had two magazines. And between you and me, I'm not a very good shot with a pistol. So I was a little bit worried, a little bit apprehensive. And I'm all the while I'm on the radio saying, guys, uh, I need you to come here. And in the very distance, about 500, 600 meters away, I can see two guys on their bikes coming towards me, going like the clappers, like Lance Armstrong, trying to get to me before this all kicks off. And then I just hear it, it just says, go, 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 put an arrest in. So. I think, right, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to shout a rest, hope that, hope that everybody throws their weapons down, and then I'll just wait here until the cavalry arrive. So in Serbokroa, I shout out, stop military, put down your weapons. 
and the first guy with the AK-47 brings his weapon up and that's a, a, a that split second I realise it's about to go noisy. So I pull my pistol and I hit him and I hit him in the hip and he sort of spins in the air and falls and the other two draw their weapons. Now, I'd love to be able to tell you that just like Mission Impossible, I brought my pistol up and I just dropped all three of them. That's not how it turned out. And it's not like in the movies. In the movies, it's a lot scarier and a lot messier. So I'm probably a good sort of 40 meters away. And they start shooting and I start shooting at them. And there's a, this like comedy few seconds. It seemed like minutes. It would have been a few seconds where we're shooting at each other and we're both missing. And I can feel the bullets pass the ear and I can feel the air moving and beside my ears. And we're shooting at each other and we're both missing. And eventually I just sort of clip one of them and he sort of staggers a bit, but he's still shooting. It's the, the target. And then the guys turn up at the back and they start putting down a heavy rate of fire. And the target himself ends up going down. But the two bodyguards were only sort of uh, wounded. And that was one of my very first jobs. Very scary, very, that's not how it's supposed to happen. And I thought I wasn't going to be in the crux of it. But sometimes, even if we were on the perimeter, we end up playing a major part. And we've kind of been like that over this period. But this is one of my first jobs. But it was part of a big, long, enduring process. And from 1997 to 2011, all 161 war criminals were either captured or arrested. Now, that was a long time, but it started with one of the first jobs was this one, Operation Tango. Not long after that, I'd sort of been bloodied and I was away with the squadron and Afghanistan was ongoing at the time, a very different environment and a very different job. And one of my jobs was they had these um, uh, drug farms that were out there and they were both drug farms and weapon training camps. So they would send foreign fighters there and train them up before either sending them to Afghanistan or to Iraq. But it was their training camps quite close to the, the Pakistani border. And our job in this instance, there was only 12 of us and we were tasked, we were going to skydive into where the farm was destroy all the drugs, we had to set them on fire, and then either arrest anybody that was on there or um, kill or capture anybody that was involved in the, the training camps. We were supposed to arrive first light, so just as it was stopped, the, it was still dark, but it would just be starting to get light, and so the temperature was quite low, and there was only supposed to be about 8 to 12 um, enemy on the target. What happened was, as normally does, there was a lot of little things that went wrong. So we got held in a holding pattern up in the air on oxygen while they decided uh, they were going to give us clearance for it to go ahead. And what that did was it allowed it to be a lot later in the day. And round about midday in Afghanistan, it can get to up to temperatures of around 50 degrees. So it was really hot and we were laden with kit and ammunition. Not only that, but it would be during the daylight and they would see us coming. They would see us coming out the sky. So we had a lot of concerns going on at the time. Anyway, we eventually get clearance, but we get an intelligence update and they tell us there's around 30 to 40 enemy on the target and it's going to take the rest of the guys a couple of hours to get there to reinforce us. And we're thinking, what? Not only is this going to be at midday at 50 degree heat, but there's now 30 to 40 enemy on the target and there's only 12 of us. Okay, who dares wins? And it sometimes life's like that. And, and we, at the time, the pilot came forward and he started playing ACDC Thunderstruck and he shook each one of us by the hand before we went out. And the, I'll, this is one of those moments that whenever they say those moments that you always remember, I'll take this with me to the grave. The ramp went down on the C-130 and we could see the ground was really small. We're up around sort of 30,000 feet. We're on oxygen. And the pilot goes, go, and we all go out and we all sort of frog out like you see this picture here, pretty much knowing that a lot of us weren't going to make it back. We skydived onto the target and there was this firefight where we cleared the camp. They weren't going to surrender and they've got reinforcements there. We managed to um, clear the camp and uh, kill a lot of the enemy. But out of the 12 of us that skydived in there, six of us were injured. There were fairly minor injuries, ranging from missing fingers to um, guys having their, their legs taken off. 
but all 12 of us survived. We only had six injuries. We had no fatalities. And we managed to destroy the, the training camp and destroy all the drugs on there. And eventually the rest of the guys turned up. So it was a massive, uh, it was a massive, massive job for us. And one, one we thought we'd never return from. I mean, you have those sorts of things and we're going to come out of COVID soon. You think it's one of those things I've survived. It's given me this experience. It's given me these memories and it's probably going to shape my rudder a little bit so that the path I've got and the perspective I have now is different to what it was when I went into it. That's my military career. I had lots of these sorts of adventures and they gave me memories. They gave me experiences and they taught me a little bit. They taught me about resilience. They taught me a little bit about there'll be times when it's tough. But the important thing is that you keep going, because when you look back, given the time, you'll be glad that you did the hard yards. You'll be glad you didn't stop. You'll be glad you decided not to give up and you'll be glad you decided to keep going. And it will be one of the things that you'll be proud of. Another of the things is that it told me was, I'm not a brave person. It told me that I'm just as scared, if not more, than anybody else when people are firing bullets off me, because I know what, the, what could happen, how that's going to turn out. But one of the things I always say is, one of the things that stopped me from running away and keep going forward into where the bullets were, were just the consequences. Sure, in that moment, I might be safer going back the way. But long term, the consequences are going to be far, far more difficult, far more difficult to live with. If I go this way, the consequences I'm going to know in the next few minutes, and I'm happier with either way, whatever those consequences are. And sometimes when we're faced with those difficult decisions, we've got to have a difficult conversation. We might have a difficult decision to make, one we don't necessarily want to have. Sometimes if we just consider the consequences, we'll come up with the right decision, one that's right for us, that sits okay with us. And I tell people, I don't want anybody in my team that's fearless or says, you know, they have no fear. I want people with fear, but will embrace it, know how to shape it, know how to manage it. And I'll embrace that and keep going forward. And really that's how winning's done. And that's how our sort of British military's got where it is. I like this quote from Churchill. It's quite, quite sort of topical at the minute. Success isn't final. Failure's not fatal. It's the courage to continue that counts. We're going to have bad days. You will already have had bad days over the past year. We just don't stop. We keep going. So if we fall over, we get up and we keep going. If we fail at something, we learn from it and we use it as a rudder to shape where we're going in the future. We don't sit in, the, in history, look back at it and go over it over again. We use it to be able to share what we're doing. We're more adaptable and versatile than we think. We don't like the unknown. We have this fear of the unknown. It's always inherently worse in our heads than what it is in real life. That's the first time you might stand up in public, speak to someone. That's the first time you jump out of an airplane with a parachute. It's always far worse in your mind before you do it. Ironically, one of the first things you do when you land on the ground after being parachuting is you want to go straight back up again. And that's completely the opposite of what you were thinking before you did the jump in the first place. So it shows you that your head can do a complete 180. It just depends on how many times you've done it. It depends on understanding that what goes on in your head might be far worse than what's going on in reality. That emotions thing's really important and it's easier said than done, but just knowing the fact that you're in control of your emotions and you can only control the controllable is one more weapon, one more tool you've got in your toolkit to be able to deal with things. I've, I've been able to do a whole lot of things in my life that I'm, you know, I never thought I'd get involved in. And a lot of it was just a sort of can-do attitude, whether it was TV, motion capture for games or public speaking. It was a privilege to serve, not in a cheesy American way, but a real privilege in that you say, you've got this sense of value and duty to society. I got involved with things with the Prince's Trust, a really difficult time in my life. And that ability to give back was something that I got really rewarded with. And it's one of the things I'm most proud of. But I would, I would never have known about it unless I was in a troubled sort of spot and got involved with it. Same with the NSPCC and going to Nepal building schools. And you see what these kids will do. They'll walk 10 miles to learn how to build a school and go back to their own environments to do it. And I think, would our kids do that? 
product of your environment perspective. I say up my own charity, Who Dares Cares, and a lot of that's about having a buddy, having a social aspect, somebody to talk to. You're going to have difficult days. Have somebody you can speak to because just talking to about it, they'll have had a bad day too and they've come out the other side of it. It was a privilege to serve then and it was a privilege to serve you today. Thank you and I can take any questions. Colin, thank you so much. Um, what I find amazing while we wait for the questions to come through is so much of what you've been able to share has, is, is backed up by ancient and relatively contemporary philosophy. Um, somebody might discuss what you've been through as anxiety. How did you manage your expectations? Because it sounds as if you stayed in the present and rolled with what was happening, kept it light, kept, stayed on your toes. How did you stop falling into the past? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. And for a lot of it, you know, I don't have all the answers. I don't claim to be an expert on life, but I think a lot of things um, help. So one thing is that sort of training, rehearsal, planning side of things. And for me, whenever I did those things, it made the training difficult and hard but it made the real thing far less scary and more like the training so that when I prepared myself for that, when it came to the real thing, it was less of a shock. Now we can apply that to business. We can apply that to real life. And that if we're really worried about a conversation or we're worried about standing up and talking in front of someone or a sp specific project, we can just role play that. We can train it. We can prepare for it, plan, make it run different courses so that when it comes to the real thing, it's far less scary. You, you touched on it a little bit in terms of that control and the controllables. And really, for things in the military, it was a lot about process. This is the process. And if you follow the process, chances are you're going to come out the other side. All this other stuff you can't control. You don't know what's going to happen. And chances are it might. But if we all stick to the process and what we can control we've got a better chance of getting through to the other side. So sometimes when we remind ourselves about that, it helps us deal with the, the things that we can affect. So drill is brill. If you know what you're doing, you can relax and just get on with uh, what's expected of you. Yeah, and I guess if I could say it as, as concisely and succinctly as that, that's probably what I would have said. <laughs> okay, thank you. What I also find incredible is what you've just taken us through just then. I think it was Epictetus, you know, back in sort of Roman days. He was a slave, but became a, a recognized philosopher. And he would say, we can't change how what happens. We can change how we feel about what happens. Just in that first story that you shared with us, how you can hang on to your fear and or get over the fear to do what you needed to do when you've got three armed men coming towards you you're in a shell suit with an earpiece and a, and a small arm, a sidearm. That must have been riveting is the understatement. That must have been really quite something. Yeah, and um, a lot of people would stand up and say, you know, I was in the SES, I was bulletproof, I knew I was quicker than them and, you know, all the rest of it. But I always knew, I always knew my own vulnerabilities. I'm a human being. I'm made of the same stuff as everybody else. And so... I had the only thing I could rely on was my training and just to follow the process and whatever way, you know, that fate decided I was going to come out the other side. As long as I could look back and say, well, you know, I did what I trained for, then that, that was it. So, yeah, I was as scared as anybody else. And it's a scary thing to be in. And no matter how much training you can do, when you hear the air shift as bullets sort of whiz past your ear, it just saps the life out of you and you've got to have faith. And again, you know, I wasn't a great shot with a pistol. I missed with a lot of shots and, you know, you're human. Remember, you're going to make mistakes. There's good, you're not going to get everything dead on. You're not going to hit with every round and, 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 and have all the answers. But what's important sometimes is just have faith in your own ability. You stay the course, you do the things you're good at and you focus on what you can control and everything else is just going to, pan the way it falls, you know. We've had a couple of questions roll in. They've disappeared from my screen, but one I've of them, them, and you, uh, thank you, Jeremy. Um, 
was uh, what is your next big challenge? It sounds like um, there was a bumpy time after you left the service. Yeah, it's it's a really good it's a really good question, and I've always um, I, I, I guess the the short answer is I don't really know what I want to be when I grow up. But the, um, the the probably the longer answer is as as my sort of journey sort of taken its its course. You know, my life's never really had a destination. I've never really said I'm going to be an astronaut and everything's going to be going towards that. I've always just sort of let my journey take me a little bit and see things I'm I'm interested in, things that I enjoy doing, and I've always enjoyed doing lots of different things. So whether I'm involved in TV and radio, writing books, whether it's motion capture for video games, it's doing the public speaking, the, the consultancy side like, like we're doing now, or, or other things. I've always enjoyed doing a little bit of everything because I feel sometimes they complement each other. So if I learn things from this, it's going to help me in a different environment. And sometimes I think that's really useful. And I think it's useful even if you do a job that's the same sort of thing every day, to do something completely different in your spare time, whether it's learn a skill of something completely different or you do a sport or a hobby, I think those things are really useful. And it's one of the things we do different in Scotland and England is that no matter what your degree is, you're forced to study something that's completely different. And you're not going to be judged too badly on it. It's not going to affect your degree, but it's something different. And I quite like that. I like that aspect of it because... It puts you out of your comfort zone. It's not going to punish you if you don't pick it up and you're not an expert on it, but it allows you to learn something else that you may or may not have an interest in, but it allows you out of your comfort zone. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Excellent. Jeremy, could you see a couple of the other questions? Yeah, I think we need to, to crack on with the questions, if that's okay, Fergus. So um, I've had one question here. How did Colin recover between missions mentally? Yeah, again, that's a good question. And I, I don't think I did properly. So as an example, I didn't talk about it today. It's one of my other missions, but I got captured on a mission and uh, taken away, stripped, naked, blindfolded, uh, mock executions. And then I got moved quite quickly from there to another part of the country. And then a few months later, I was out in the military altogether. Now, there was never any sense of decompression. There was no debrief. There was no how are you? What went on? You know, write it down, speak about it, share experiences, use things that might help if you have symptoms that come out from it. I just left the, the military. So the next day there was no debrief. And within a few months, I left the army and there was nothing on it. Now, at the time, I probably had a lot going on and didn't realize it. And actually, I had a few symptoms that sort of crept out over the next sort of one to 10, 10 years. And I didn't realize it in myself, but those were all sort of symptoms of PTSD. And had they been addressed at the time and in the years that followed, it probably would have had less of an impact on my life. I think now the military gets that better. At the time, they didn't. So it's really important to do and have if, if you have a place of work. Hmm. That's, that's really interesting. And I'm just conscious of time. So there, there's a couple of questions that we haven't got time to, to, to actually ask. But... There is a bit of recognition here for you. So what one of the delegates has said, what an amazing life. And may I thank you for your service to King, and, sorry, to, to Queen and country. Um, we all owe you a lifetime of gratitude, which I thought was rather nice. Um, the same person said, my father served in the SAS in the Second World War. He passed away over 20 years ago. Um, never spoke about his experiences, but did teach him um, some well-heeled values and grit. So, yeah, different different times now, isn't it? I mean, uh, back then, you know, the SAS and SBS and special forces were were very much, um, you know, very, very much under un, under the radar rather than have TV programs uh, and, and, and uh, people people jumping on the kind of um, fame bandwagon, which which I can say firsthand, you're not one of those people far from it. And that's why we're working with you, Colin, because you come with so much authenticity and value so um we're going to have to move on because we are sort of slightly running over even by a minute or two but being a military man you know that very quickly those one or two minutes of rolling over time can can, can become a bit of a bit of a problem so colin thanks very much what i'm going to do is i'm going to put you back in the um 
in, in, in the delegate uh, room, if that's okay. And um, yeah, thank you for everything and uh, really appreciate you giving, you giving your insight. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Colin. Right, how do I do this? <laughs> this is where the fun and games comes. Um, just bear with me. Gosh, is uh, due with us at 3.50. Is she ready? She is, yeah. I'm just going to bring her on now. You should be on any second. So Goshia uh, Gorner is an award-winning transformational coach and speaker. Uh, she's an author, recognised for the expansion game, a powerful method to transform your fear into brilliance. And she's won an award for the best coaching book in the Soul and Spirit Book Awards 2018. So uh, quite an incredible achievement in, in, in its own right. Um, but what's really important for us today is she helps change makers become all the more impactful and turn their biggest fears into success, which is a really nice segue from Colin's first-hand experience. And I really got it when he said, you want to go back up in the plane again. Um, and um, that's not always an option for us. So it's going to be really interesting to see what Gosia can bring and help us with uh, this afternoon in her experience uh, firsthand and working with others through change and turning um, fear into achievement. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Fergus. Uh, can everybody hear me well? Yes? Yep. Yes. All good here. Thank you. Fantastic. Okay, everyone, it's my great pleasure and privilege to, to be here with you and also to hear uh, Colin speak so amazingly about his experiences and he was speaking about fear, which I'm going to speak about from a different side. So um, here we have a hero that has actually faced his biggest fears and he survived it. So if he survived his biggest fears and fear of death, I'm sure we can actually survive our fears and turn them into successes. So um, let me bring my presentation on the screen. Fergus, can you tell me, confirm, I'm starting a little bit earlier. Um, what time do I need to speak, uh, speak until? What time do we finish? Okay, um, you're uh, clear until 20 minutes past four. Then we've got a 10 minute Q&A. So uh, any um, time, if your presentation finishes a little earlier, uh, we'll be able to deal with all the more questions in the Q&A slot, the 10-minute Q&A slot, okay? Uh, lost you, Gosia. Yes, can you hear me now? Hello, that's back. Yes, I can. Did you hear that? So you're okay till 20 past four. Then we have a 10-minute Q&A. Um, but if we finish any earlier, we'll enjoy more questions. So uh, over to you, guys. Okay, fantastic. Okay, um, so let me just start the presentation. Uh, can I share my screen? Let me, um, yeah, we are here. Sure. Okay. Okay. Fergus, can you uh, confirm that you can see my screen, darling? Yes, I can. There's someone excited looking at a laptop from <laughs> yes. Theatre Brilliance. <laughs> there we go. So my talk today um, is all about From Fear to Brilliance. And the reason why I feel so passionate about it and so excited about it is because I actually used to be a very fearful person. I've had a very traumatic childhood. And I have learned that um, if I don't run towards fear, which is exactly what Collie was saying today, I may probably die myself or may never actually get out of the, the craziness and the madness that I was in. When I, my father was an alcoholic, so I had to be on a daily basis facing a choice between um, should I stay at home, should I leave, we even had to face a possibility with my brother of possibly even killing him. My brother once came to, to my bedroom in, at, at night and he said, look, you know, you see what's going on. I think the only, the only way we're going to make it and survive is to actually kill him. 
And um, so can you imagine what can go on in a child's head to see no way out from the situation but to kill the father, to, um, to save the mother and save himself and, and, and his sister. So you'll be glad to know we have not killed my father and he lived till he was 75, quite, quite actually happily. But what this taught me is that a very, very early age of how to work with my emotions. And today, what I would love you to do is I would actually love you to think about something that you would like to shift in your life and specifically I would love you to think about something that you desire that you would love to achieve that you would like to bring into your life that you would like to see happen something that maybe was with you for a very long time but you've been procrastinating about it you've been thinking well it's not the right time maybe I'm not good enough maybe I am uh, maybe I'm too old, maybe I'm too young, who would listen to me, why should there be another book on the subject? Many people have already spoken about it. So I would like you to think about something that you would very much love to achieve, do, create, communicate, but there is something that is stopping you and most likely that it's fear. So hopefully by the end of today, in my today's uh, to 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 topic and talk, there will be some nuggets, there will be some tools, there will be something that you can use to go forward. And so, a um, few things about me I would like you to, uh, to, to know. Well, I came to England in my 20s because I had no, no choice between, uh, actually I had a choice, stay in Poland and go crazy or die, or come to England and learn English and do what I've really always wanted to do, which is was to travel and help people. And interestingly enough, because I faced my biggest fear, which was actually leaving everything behind, going to, to a country I didn't know, with no money, I have to add, um, because I faced it and I came through the, the, the fear, life has actually invited me to step into my, into my greatness. And of course, I had a lot of challenges when I was younger and we still do, but because I have learned how to dance with the fear, something amazing has happened. And so now, as, as you know, I'm a coach, I'm an international speaker, and I work with change makers. But the thing that I am really proud of and that I want to share with you is this amazing book, which is called The Expansion Game. And very briefly, I wanted to show with you how it came about, how it was born. And um, it started many, many years ago. I, I was um, a, a therapist in a breast cancer clinic. I work with women who have been diagnosed and some of them has received um, information that they may die in a few months, in a few years. And some of them received the information that they will be much better soon after the chemo but they need to learn how to re release the stress or eat better. And so it was an alternative clinic. So I very much uh, was at, at the place for them where I could support them in whatever future was holding for them. So if they were supposed to get better and survive, I was there to help, help them release the, the pain, the fear, the sadness, anger, stress, and things that may have actually contributed to the cancer. And there were some of them who actually were, were walking towards death and I was actually holding them in this process and helping them to face it so they were not that scared. They would sort of walk towards it quite reassured that it's actually not the end of the world as we know it. And one of those days, I will never forget it, it was July, it was a beautiful sunny day. It was actually like today, it was beautiful and warm and sunny. This beautiful young woman came into my, um, into my room. She was 24, she was very young, beautiful, blonde hair, blue eyes. And she walked through the, through the door crying. And she wasn't just crying, she was sobbing. She was like... <laughs> She sat down on the chair in front of me and she kept on repeating, uh, I don't want to die, I don't want to die, I don't want to die. And nothing that I said, nothing that I've done 
No, nothing that I did for her made any difference. She was just repeating this like almost in, in, um, in trance. I don't want to die. And I've asked her, her name was Sophie. I've asked Sophie, Sophie, who told you you're going to die? And she said, basically, I'm not stupid. Um, it's, it's, it's basically, I know statistics. My mother died of cancer. My sister died of cancer. I have the gene. I will die too. And, um, and I said, how can I help you then? And she goes, well, you can't. And then I thought to myself, I have never been in situation that I was completely unable to help a client. I always can help, um, always can help people as best as I can. So I've made a little prayer connected to my higher self. I've asked for some guidance to deliver a solution for this, for this young woman. And actually for me, all I've asked that she would be able to walk out of this place uh, peaceful, calm, and not necessarily with a smile on her face, but not to be, to be able to go home, eat, sleep, um, and live, and actually live however long she had left. And by the way, she had a lot, many, 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 many years. I've, I've known her for many years after, and then we lost it touch because I don't know what has actually happened with her but I have to say that on that day I came up with an idea that I want to share with you and it was completely intuitive completely came from my from this intuitive genius that was all about facing the biggest fear which was what Colin was about talking about and embracing it and dancing with it instead of turning around and running away from it and so I had this idea to, 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 to share with her um, that, um, that I, I basically I've asked her to, to imagine that she could die and be okay about this. And I've, I've asked her to actually say this to, to me. I said, Sophie, can you please repeat after me? I allow myself to die and I'm looking forward to it. To which she replied, you are crazy. I'm going downstairs to the reception to complain that you are tormenting me. And something came over me and I held the door and I said, Sophie, I will not let you go till you say this. And so I was not only facing the possibility of upsetting this woman profoundly, even more than she was, but I was also facing the opportunity of losing my job completely and probably get myself into some sort of trouble. And so she said, all right, I'll say this. And she said, I allow myself to die and I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to meeting my sister and my mother. And I'm, yeah, I'm really, truly looking forward to it. And then she took a deep breath in. She breathed out. And I said to her, please say now, I allow myself to heal. I allow myself to get better. I allow myself to fulfill my dreams because she was very talented. She was making movies, she was writing. I allow myself to write and to do the movies and be successful and marry my boyfriend and the children. I have the most incredible life and I'm looking forward to it. And we went a few times backwards and forwards and then she stopped crying. She sat down on the chair and she went, that was really crazy. And I said to her, why did you stop crying? And she goes, well, I'm just fed up with it now. Can we just get on with something else? And um, and we did. And we talked about her life and what she wants to do next. We talked if if she was to die and she only had a few months to live or a few years, how would she want to live that life? And, and if she had another 20, 30, 40, 50, what would she want to do as well? And somehow that was the turning point for her, but it was also a turning point for me because in that moment, um, in that session, this new technique was born, which I believe came from some other place of, of, of greatness. It wasn't created by me, even though I'm a creator of it, I didn't actually create it. It was a gift. And so I went um, on and I tested this technique of, on every single person who came that day, every single person who came next day. And I, because I was also working as a, as a coach, not just as a therapist, I tested it and I've discovered something amazing. I've discovered that, um, that fears are amazingly 
important and necessary in terms of our growth and expansion. And without dealing with the fears, we wouldn't be able to grow and expand. It's like a child is actually doing something and it's maybe in the beginning, it's um, um, not sure if it's scary or it's not scary, but it needs to actually learn and do it in order to develop the, the, the skills and the muscles to walk and to run and to cycle. And so they are so necessary that without them, we wouldn't be actually knowing where to go next. So for instance, they, they pointed the way to new opportunities and the new areas of miracles, expansion and contribution. So for instance, I, when I was much younger, I was petrified of public speaking. I can even tell you that when I was about to deliver my first workshop um, to a gro group of business people on a boat, um, and I was in my 20s. Um, I had a diarrhea, and I'm not afraid to say that, for two weeks, constantly, every day, till I've done it, and the people said, oh, we, we actually quite love it, uh, we find it very useful. It was actually about how to use intuition in decision making. And they wanted more and wanted more and wanted more, and I thought, my God, I haven't died. So then I started doing more trainings, and. And presentations and I discovered I loved I loved it my life changed again and um, so basically fears are doorways for which we'll access the more empowered successful fulfilling life but the problem is that often we do not know right that we are even afraid of, of things and we procrastinate we tell ourselves stories we avoid we hide we play small and we actually become selfish and this is what I find extremely sad, that we become selfish as human beings because we think that we don't, we're not good enough, it's not the right time, people will laugh at, our, laugh at us, you know, we will somehow get hurt, found out as a fraud. We don't share the greatness with people, which we're meant to share because without it, someone else will not find the solution or the answer to the biggest problems. So. And the biggest you know, excitement for me is, when I started working with people on this, is that the bigger the fear, the bigger the shift that will follow. So if you, like, if you were to measure your fear from, uh, from one to 10, and your fear is eight, then you know that if you shift this fear, your life will change profoundly, like incredibly. And if the fear is like 10 out of 10, then your life will be, um, unrecognizable okay so i have uh, created a name for those very specific fears which i tend to work with on daily basis with my clients and i call them expansive fears and i and i call them expansive fears because they expand you in order for you to step into your true size to your brilliance to your greatness so you can shine brightly and they are good and I would really suggest that you start looking at those fears with love and lean into them, you know, embrace them, like beautifully, like Colin has actually said. So he was not running away from the bullets, he was running towards them. And the expansive fears that I almost work on a daily basis with almost every single client. So if you think that you are unique with your fears or you're not, every single person I work with, has them so that the ones that I put in the um, um, the whole that are, that are involved not being good enough, fear of failure, fear fear of being found out as a fraud, um, and being a fear of being successful and visible are the the fears that I I have to say they are the doorways to to people's success. Being successful and visible that that's an interesting um, those are interesting because often people are more afraid of success than they are afraid of not being good enough and that was such an incredible development but i had to spend with them quite long to actually dive quite deep for instance one of my my clients said um, you know i have such a great idea for this business and i know it will help so many people people are waiting for it but if i truly become more successful than i already have been I know that I will have no time for my ch children. My husband will leave me. 
owl uh, get sick again and she she was actually pr previously she had cancer so because she was uh, working too much and she said well i will be successful i will be visible i will make a difference but i may die in the process so if we don't find a, a way of dealing with this um, those fears may stop us from doing what we we're actually born to do and this is the biggest um you know the biggest challenge and the biggest thing that we need to learn how to um, to play with now um sometimes i've already mentioned people do not know they are afraid and so they could be successful they could be doing things already but um they may not actually be doing it in the right way for instance they may be pushing too much they could be uh too harsh on themselves a lot of leaders that i have worked with they have um drove the, the people crazy because they were afraid of not fulfilling the expectations of the people above them and they were so harsh on the people and so disrespectful but what was actually driving it was fear so by actually being very honest with yourself and writing every single fear down which could be running the show right now then you be becoming more aware and clear and you know what you're dealing with and therefore have more power and more choices so how do we know if fear is running the show so often when we actually are affected by fear but we may not even know it we tend to exaggerate so the example of the exaggeration you know um i was for instance um asked many times gosh i love this technique have you written anything about it? And I said, no, not really. I mean, nothing, nothing, not, not even an article, not even a, a, like a book or ebook. And I, I said, no. And they said, why not? And, I, and what I would do, I would say, well, it takes so long to write a book. It is such a big deal. And, um, and it, it's very expensive. And and you you can't really find um, a publisher very easily i was exaggerating the whole process enormously well i would minimize my importance i would say well what what would i have to say about fear that that's not been already said out there i'm not really that important i'm a small fish in a big pond i i don't really matter i would, I would say that right and i would basically uh, generalize things as well you know i would say that um nobody who has ever published a book has made any money that doesn't really make any difference so be generalizing things but the things that i was really good at and my clients are really good at long complicated stories you know well I, I would love to do this but i have to do this and then i have to run this course and i have to go to uh, australia and then i have to run a training in america and this this unbelievable combination and chain of stories my clients and my my friends would just nod their head and go yeah and you know they, they used to buy it and there was one day um i went to a birthday party it was a very specific day we were sitting around the, the table in the garden and nobody knew me apart from the the birthday girl and people everybody said you know what they are who they are and i said my name is gosha i i am a specialist in turning biggest fears into biggest successes and this woman said to me show us how, how how you do this and i said sure is there any around anybody around here who who's got a fear that's stopping them from doing what they want and this woman picked the hand up and she said i am a painter but i haven't painted in 10 years and i said why and she said well because i've got kids i'm too busy my life is far too complicated i don't have a place to paint and plus actually who would look at it anyway i'm not such a good painter so i've taken her through this process she cried she shifted she she got excited and she goes oh my god i'm going to go home and i'm going to order my paints today after this this meeting and i went around the table i've done this on everybody and this woman said um, to me uh, she said have you written a book and i and i said no <laughs> and she goes why not and I went into exaggeration, minimizing, generalization, and you know, long-winded stories. And she stopped me and she said, Gosha, this is, I, I quote, I don't swear. She said, Gosha, this is fucking bullshit. You actually are afraid of writing your own book. And I said, bloody hell, yes. Thank you. So she sent me home with a homework to do this technique on myself. And 
and I did. And there we go. And the book has been written many years ago. And I also have to say that by writing it and facing every possible fear on the way that, that it's related to, to, to writing a book, I have discovered that, that what Colin said is actually true. He said that what goes in your head, it's much worse than what goes in reality. Nothing that I have gone through, through writing and sourcing the people and, um, and artists and, and um, designers and editors, nothing was even the slightest way challenging in the way that I have imagined it, okay? But the, um, but the benefits to me, but also to people were so huge that if you have right now in your mind something that you want to do, business related or not business related, that you even have the slightest idea that you may be procrastinating because you're scared, please stop. Don't give yourself all those stories and go and do it because not only you'll be shifted and joyous and you'll be impactful but also because you will expand as a person beyond this the stories the dramas and things which are actually not true right so the fear programs may sometimes lead to retreating having no boundaries or aggression now you obviously know all of those things but i just want to remind you that um you know, when we are sometimes scared and all those anxieties are going in our head, it may actually lead to adrenal exhaustion and tiredness. So when we are not fulfilling what we meant to do, but we are just going around and around and around in our head with those stories, it's actually exhausting. And if you find yourself saying, I'm so exhausted, I'm so exhausted, I'm so exhausted, it could be simply because you are retreating where you should be stepping forward. It's something worth actually considering about. And also when we are afraid, sometimes that could lead to depression. Um, I mean, there's many different reasons for depression, but a lot of my clients who I saw sitting in front of me, in the end, they, they've, you know, they've told me, actually, I do feel depressed because I have got so much talents, but I'm not really doing what I came here to do because I'm scared. But no boundaries, another way of um, how we, we can recognize that someone is scared. The good girl, you know, always saying yes. I used to do that too when I was much younger. Could you do this, Gosha, for me? Doesn't matter, it's 12 p.m. Doesn't matter, it's 1 a.m. in the morning. So of course, yes, yes, always saying yes, which it comes out of fear of people not liking you. So um, always wanting to be loved, liked. So that also leads to burnout, breakdowns, illnesses. A lot of my clients who I met in the breast cancer clinic, they, they actually were the, the good, good girls who always said yes, always put other people first, never putting themselves first. Aggression. Now, we all know that people who are afraid can be aggressive, but what I want to bring your attention to is aggression towards yourself. So sometimes when you tell yourself in a very aggressive way, you should have done it differently, why didn't you do this, that should have been done better. Being very, very aggressive towards yourself also sometimes shows that um, we could be afraid of something, okay? So those are some of the hidden, hidden wa ways that, um, that or, or reasons that we could actually look at and see where we could be afraid but we are not knowing that we are. So, so I think for now I've said enough and what I would love you to do is to show you how this technique works. And um, in a moment, we're going to bring Jimmy, uh, Jimmy who is a volunteer, um, a willing volunteer I must add, but um, just before we uh, take him um, and bring him here on, on screen. I wanted to sh sh show with you something. So essentially my job always when I work with people is to help them to be as centered, calm and peaceful and clear as possible. But typically when we are affected by fear, we are somewhere um, on this um, pendulum where we're dealing with something and the fear is run, running at the back of our mind 
where we actually imagining things, imagining things worse than they really are, or we even going to catastrophic places without never voicing them out loud. And those fears, when they are not voiced and not shared, like Colin said earlier, you've never spoken to someone about it, they have the biggest power over you and they basically control the show. So um, as an example, a, a friend of mine some, some years ago uh, was afraid of, she's written two books and she wanted to write the third one. She was petrified of sharing the true experiences that she had, that she ended up in psychiatric hospital, that she tried to commit suicide and, and that her father used to beat her and the mother. And she said, nobody knows about this. If people find out that I, that I spent years or months doing this or, she, or being challenged with that, they will not see me as a successful scientist, psychologist, and they will reject me. And I asked her, and what will happen then? She said, I will not be able to work. And I said, what will happen then? And she said, well, basically, I will have to take my daughter and live with her on the street under the bridge. So she went straight from writing the book in, to basically being rejected, not being considered as a, as a truthful, successful person, all the way after a few seconds, she went to being actually on the street street and being poor and basically not being able to look after her daughter and by saying this out loud she became so conscious of it that it was actually funny what is the likelihood that she will end up with her daughter on the street it's virtually zero right in her case by the way i'm not saying in everybody's case so by speaking this out loud and facing it and allowing this fear to be put on the table and flashing the light upon it things change you step into your power you are in your center and you actually can look at the other side which is what would you prefer instead if things could be much much better than expected what would you love to see happening in your life and then it's only when you go beyond beyond what you could ever imagine to something more positive and more amazing that you've ever voiced or gone to then the, 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 the shift happens and the centeredness, it's connected with power, intuition and inspired action. So for now, I would like to um, say this is enough of me speaking um, at you. Mm, for now, I would love to say, um, Fergus, can you please bring Jimmy up on screen here so we can play with him? Thank you. Oh, hi. Hello, Jimmy. Hello, Hi, Gossier. Hi. <laughs> so, um, yesterday I had a quick chat with Jimmy, like, uh, for 12 o'clock. Yes, we had a quick, we had a quick chat, uh, no, in the morning, right? Because I wanted to double check if he's not too scared to be our volunteer, <laughs> whether he would be willing to, to play with me. And, um, so just to, to let you know what will happen now. I'm, uh, I'm going to ask Jimmy a few questions to establish what actually, um, where he is and what, what, what he's feeling and, um, and what he needs. And then we do this quickly. And then if we have time, we will have some questions. So Jimmy, darling, please tell me, um, and please tell everyone, what is your goal? What is, what is it that you would love to see happening? I'd love to be able to grow my business. Uh, I'd like, love to be able to reach um, business owners and families and um, provide the service I love providing. That's to connect people and watch people have a lot of fun. That's my goal. And tell people what you do so they can sort of position it in their mind. I run a no money, fun, interactive casino service. The idea is to get people in a room playing um, casino games uh, without money to connect them, to create an atmosphere of bonding, especially in a time like this. That's what I do. Absolutely. So it gives people a sense of connection, fun, playfulness, forgetting about all the problems. That's but right. obviously, that, that's, uh, you know, personally. But in business sense, um, that also creates so solutions, uh, problem solving, uh, bringing them together so they actually can achieve more as a team. Is that right? 
I believe so. Yes. Yes. And, and Jimmy, uh, one of your goals, and it's not even your goal, but also Jeremy's uh, wish for you is that you don't only do it as a hobby, but you actually make money from this. Is that right? That's correct. Yes. And um, because if you do this and, and, and do it even very, very well and you, and you don't make any money from this, it's not going to really help anyone uh, long term because you you will die of starvation, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it means I'll probably have to take on something else and stop doing it. That's right. Okay, so what we want is a successful business that people can uh, hire you for and and uh, they can buy, but also you making good money from it. Yes. Yes, please. Yes. So tell us now what, in your opinion, what is the, the, the fear which could be stopping you from charging good money and communicating to your clients what this product will do for them and, and charging money for it? What, what stops you from this? Uh, I've been thinking about this. Um, you see, I come from the casino industry. Yes. And they always have all these signs around saying, oh, when the fun stops, um, when the fun stops, um, Please stop playing and all that. But the truth is, I don't think they care that much about the customers. The idea is to bring people in. So when I hear people saying, oh, uh, I want us, we're doing everything for mental health. We're doing everything to bring our cost, uh, uh, to make our workers work better. I'm not sure if what they really mean is we need to tick these boxes, but keep everyone working. So I don't see why they would want to pay good money for the service I provide. I know families do it, but when I go to corporates and I try to sell the same idea, I'm not sure if the corporates want it. So I don't really know how to charge them. Is that right? Okay, so the one fear is that you have something great that gives people fun, but the corporates may not, not want it. It may be useless for them, right? It may not be priority for them. It might be just ticking boxes and saying, yes, uh, we're looking after our staff. It might be, I don't know. Maybe that's just a mindset shift I need. Exactly. Okay, so that's one fear. What, what other fears uh, do you have uh, when you're actually showing your product and saying this is the, the moment when you need to actually say this is how much it costs? What else stops you? I'm always scared of people perceiving me as being greedy. Yes. And that, that's always been, I, I, I can't explain why I, I, I sometimes undersell or undervalue what I do because I don't want them to say, oh, he's a bit greedy. How can he expect us to pay this amount for that? I do have that problem. Okay. So we have two fears, right? Like two basic fears. One is that people, th the people think that you're greedy. If you measure that fear on a scale from one to 10, if 10 is big fear and one is tiny fear, just ch check it with your body. Check it with your um, with yourself. How strong is that fear? That people may think you are greedy. I think it's high up there. <laughs> I think it's high up there. Yes. Give me a number. I'd go eight. Yeah, that's exactly what I saw. I saw eight. And how strong is the fear that the uh, the business that you have, the business concept you have, it will be completely useless and, and pointless to business people? No, one. Ah, so after doing the homework I've given you, you know that it's that it's uh, useful, right? Yes, please. Yes. Ah, okay, good. You've done your homework really well. I've read. It. Okay, so so the main fear really is that people think that you are greedy. Yeah. I I think if I charge people, they will perceive. If I charge people a light, uh, a high amount, that I think they might perceive me as being greedy. Yes. Okay. Great. Okay. So what we're going to do, we're going to look at your fear. We're going to make it bigger. And then we're going to look at your intention and we're going to make it bigger as well. So Jim, what I would love to ask you now is tell me, um, if you, if you had a magic wand for a moment, okay. And you could actually, um, deliver this, this product to, to businesses. What would you absolutely love? This product to do for them like just tell me in one one sentence i'd love the product to boost their morale make them forget about the trials they're going through and just feel really happy about to live in the moment for at least a few hours mm -hmm. what else would you would you want to help them with as well so yes to forget to be happy what else would you if you could what would you love to help them with while they learn all those games 
I'd, I'd, I'd love them to feel a lot more confident about themselves, feel like they can learn new things and feel like life is not so bad after all. It's something to do with breeding happiness in people, something that makes you feel valued. That's another one. That's why we say treating people like royalty. Ah, fantastic. Okay. And okay, so that's good. So we leave this on the side. Let's go to the fear. So, Jimmy, if people thought that you are a greedy bastard, he's uh, selling happiness, but he wants to, to take money from us. He's really, really, really greedy. What would be the worst thing that would happen if people started thinking about you as a greedy man? The worst thing? They wouldn't be able to build relationships with me. Uh-huh. And then what would happen? Um, they would only work with me if if there were terms that forced them to they wouldn't do it willingly and i'm 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 not really comfortable working with people working with people if they're not doing it because they want to they're doing it because they there are some repercussions of them not working with me so what would be the, then the worst possible thing if people um didn't build the, the relationship with, with you because they didn't trust you and they didn't like you and they thought they were greedy that you're greedy, what would be the worst thing about that? I'd have no work. Okay, and if you had no work, this kind of work, because maybe you could get other kind of work, so if you couldn't do this kind of work anymore, what would be the worst thing? I'd probably end up, a end up doing a job I have no passion for. And then what would happen? I'd be pretty unhappy, I think so. Okay, and what would then happen? What, what's the worst thing that would happen? If you couldn't do what you love, Oh. I th I, for me, I think it will create it will create a lot of um, isolation and pain in my world. I think so. Okay, see there we go. So you you are a man who is all about building connections and connecting with people and giving them joy, right? Connection and joy is your biggest values, bringing them happiness. Yeah. Okay, and and if you if you let's just even go to a worse place than this. So if it created the total isolation and, and, and pain in your world, what was the worst thing that, that, would, that would happen? The worst, the worst, the worst, the, the worst. Uh, I, could th I could think of things like losing your home. Yes. Getting divorced. Um, feeling like a failure. That's right. Uh, yeah. Okay. So losing everything. Okay. So that's the, the worst thing. Now let's go to the best thing. Jim. Instead of people thinking that you're greedy, when it, when, it, when it comes to charging them, what would you want them to think when you go, oh, it costs 500 pounds <clears throat> to take your, <clears throat> sorry, to take your team through this process and to take the whole group through this process? What would you want them to think about it? I'd like them to believe it's that, to feel it's, it's good value. Yes. It's, it's, it's helping them to be more productive. It's helping them to be happier. That's how I'd want them to feel. Okay, so you, they were like, oh, really, 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 really want it. We, we, we want, to, want to have this guy. We trust him. We can see the value in it. What do you think this will lead to if you started working with them? It would lead to growth. It would lead to them ref referring me to other people saying, oh, you really want to try this guy's service. It's very good. It's, it's, it's helped us. That's what I would believe it would lead to. And what do you think then will happen in your life? I would feel more fulfilled. Uh huh. And then what would happen? My financial situation would improve. <laughs> and and Jimmy, if you had plenty and plenty of money, like more money than you've ever had in your entire life, and you did what you love, what do you what do you think would then happen in your world? What else would this lead you to? Uh, to be fair, I think for me personally, I it would give me the opportunity to do things for people. Where I don't have to charge them. Like what? Where, what would you be doing for them? Sometimes it's about supporting charities, reaching out to family, reaching out to people who are struggling. That's right. Who specifically would you support? Like who is closest, closest in you, to in your heart? It's funny because I have. I think I would reach out to a lot more people that that I've, I I used to do a lot of work with care homes. And I have a soft spot for elderly people. I always have. Okay. So if you had st started a lot more money doing this, you could actually create some form of foundation or something 
where you could do go to ch to to care homes and do all of that stuff for, for them for free and maybe train other people who would do that for free Is, this makes sense what i'm saying yes um and bring those older people also joy and fun and pleasure so the businesses could pay more and they would know that they're paying some of the money towards fulfilling your dream to help other people i yes? believe so yes okay Great. So now I have the, all the ammunition. I have one last question. Jimmy, if you manage to make more money than you've ever imagined, and then you could start supporting people who struggle, particularly the older people, and bring them connection and joy and happiness, what do you think then will happen for them? Sorry, can you what would, happen, what would happen for those older people if you had more money and more time and space to deliver those things for free what would happen to those older people i think it would give them a lot more joy i've seen i've seen the elderly people when i've done events for them in care homes they they live in the moment they enjoy it and, and I, I always walk out of there smiling it, there's a feeling they give you when you see them happy that's right so you see by not allowing yourself to make more money not allowing yourself to expand not allowing yourself to to to, to bring more money into your world you're not, you're not, it's actually essentially you, you, you are selfish. <laughs> and, I, and I know it sounds crazy, but when we are not allowing ourselves to expand, there is someone somewhere that could be helped by us, but it's not. So if I never wrote that book, all the thousands of people who have wrote the book, read the book would have not read it because I would be still scared. Do you understand? I understand. So I think you own it to those guys, to those guys and lots of other guys, to do what you came here to do, okay? To show up in your greatness. So now, Jimmy, we, we take a deep breath in, breathe out, and re repeat after me. And remember, this is a game, take it lightly, we're playing. Say this, I allow myself. I allow myself. To think that uh, other people will judge me when I do what I came here to do to allow other people to judge me when I do what I came here to do. And I allow myself to be so petrified of the judgment. And I allow myself to be so petrified of the judgment. And thinking, and then thinking that I am, that I am um, greedy. And, sorry, and, repeat that please. And them thinking that I am greedy. And, and them thinking that I am greedy. That, that I allow myself to stop doing this work altogether. That I allow myself to stop doing this work altogether. And do other things. And do other things. Like drive, drive a van or something. Like drive a van or something. <laughs> or maybe do nothing. Or maybe do nothing. And never do what I love. And never do what I love. And live my life in a miserable way and live my life in a miserable way and waste my talents and waste my talents and and not actually fulfill my great greatest gifts and not actually fulfill my greatest gifts and not have all those all the people who are waiting for me right now and not have all the people who are waiting for me right now and i'm looking forward to being selfish <laughs> And, and I'm looking forward to being selfish. And, and scared. And scared. And keep on hiding. And keep on hiding. For the rest of my life. For the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. Take a deep breath in and just let it all go. Ah, and I'll say this, I also allow myself. I also allow myself. To, to be honest with myself. To be honest with myself. And be honest with my clients and be honest with my clients and show them all the gifts and benefits that they will have and show them all the gifts and benefits that they will have and um and for them to love what i'm offering and for them to love what i'm offering and to bring them closer with each other and to bring them closer with each other to to build the um the team feeling in in a team to build the team feeling in the team and connect them even more strongly. And connect even more strongly. Make them even more successful. Make them even more successful. But primarily give them sense of joy and happiness. And primarily give them sense of joy and happiness. 
so they can be happier doing what they do. So they can be happier doing what they do. And I allow them to pay me as much as I want to. And I allow them to pay me as much as I want them to. Yeah, uh, as much as I want them to. Yeah, as much as I w want them to. Want them to. But also pay me more towards my foundation. But it also pay me more towards my foundation. So I can help the, those older people. So that I can help those older people. With ease and with grace. With ease and with grace. And um, and make a big difference for, for them. Make a big difference for them. And maybe even train other people uh, how to do what I do. And maybe even train other people to do what I do. So all the all, so so the care home so the people who live in the care homes so have a lot of fun. So the people who live in the care homes have more fun. And joy. And joy. And they feel connected. And they feel connected. And I'm looking forward to to char to charging what what I'm worth. And I look forward to charging what I'm worth. Doing what I love. Doing what I love. Inspire those business people. Inspire those business people. And inspire my older people. And inspire my older people. That who I love. Who I love. And I'm looking forward to it. And I'm looking forward to it. Take a deep breath in and breathe out. Close your eyes, darling. And I want you to go into the future, like in your mind's eye, just imagine that you're moving into the future, but a year from now, when your business is really nicely organized, you have your mission statement, you have your website, where people know exactly what they benefit from you, particularly the businesses, and they really um, recommend you re really successfully from one, one business to the next, and they love you. And I want you to go and sit there and look around uh, when you are actually booked up in advance and they know what, what, what you need to do, um, they, they know what you charge. Tell me, Jimmy, when you're there in the future, how does it feel? It feels very good. <laughs> mm -hmm. And what are you seeing there? Just tell us quickly, what, what's happening there? What do you see yourself doing? I see myself laughing with people, high-fiving people, having a great time. Mm -hmm. And tell me, when, you, when it comes to selling yourself, what are you doing differently? I think I'm more confident about telling them what products I have and why I, should be, why I can charge a certain way. Okay, what is the advice that the future you would give you now, at this moment? What is the advice? Don't be scared to name your price as long as you're putting the right value on the table. Wonderful. Okay, great. Open your eyes. Just measure the fear. I know that we're about to finish. Just measure the fear right now in this moment. It was eight. How does it feel right now? <laughs> I think I'll, I'll, I'll bring it down to about five or six, actually, honestly. Brilliant. And what do you think this made the, the fear smaller? I'm recognizing that what I'm doing, if it's if what I'm doing is bringing happiness and value to some other people, I should be charging more. Else, I won't have the opportunity to do what I do. Absolutely. So just combine it in your mind. The what what you're offering with those people who are waiting for you. Okay, those older people. See that it's all connected. And um, you and and just one last thing I want to say, Jimmy. Gosh, no, I'm sorry. We're really over time. I'm yes. really sorry. Okay. I'll so, up. To the end of it, we'll finish this, Jimmy, later. Thank sorry you. for running over, and th thank you for being the the the, the volunteer. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry for Fergus. Yeah. Gosh, uh, I'm sorry. We've run out of time for questions as yes, well. I'm... Um. We're going to have to uh, wrap this section up now. Um, perhaps if anyone would be kind enough to email any questions, uh, then we can deal with them after the presentation finishes. Yes, Joshua, I'll... thank you so much for sharing your uh, special talents with us this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you, Vegas. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jeremy, can you hear me? I can indeed, Fergus. I can indeed. Um, would you be able to um, pop my first slide up, please? Of course, and, yeah. Um, 
thank you ever so much uh, to Gosha and to Jimmy there. I'm sorry we're over time. I will attempt to deal with the uh, final section um, as thoroughly and uh, yes, as quickly as I can. Uh, it's an interesting concept. Here we are, harnessing change, the challenge of forgiveness. Uh, well, why the challenge of forgiveness? Um, I think it's a very interesting concept, um, given all that we've heard from our speakers uh, in terms of the challenges that they faced in life. How can you move forward when you're stuck in the past? Um, we can't stop change, that's for sure. But in order to embrace change, we have to be able to set ourselves free of the past. Next slide, please, Jeremy. Okay, so we need to deal with the difficult emotions um, that we experience in our lives, because when we don't, they can keep us stuck. They can stop our progression or get in the way of the change that we want to make. So we need forgiveness. And I wanted to just create a couple of bullet points here so that you could see some typical emotions uh, that we experience on a day-to-day -day basis. Anxiety, for example, is when we perceive a threat. And because we may have something in the future that we're anxious about, it can stop us from changing or living in the moment. And we heard with Colin that he was able to remain in the moment despite his difficult past and see it through. Uh, incredible insights to how he harnessed his own weaknesses to become strengths. Shame is another emotion that uh, we can struggle with, and that's generally linked to how others may feel about us. And that's how we use our imagination, because often we don't know. Psychodynamically, we often say that shame is fed by secrets. So sometimes when we're able to share what we're feeling shameful about, it no longer holds any power. Depression results from loss or failure, and change incidentally nearly always means some kind of loss that we have to come to terms with. I've dealt with this um, in previous shows, and um, I didn't want to rerun the slide, so I've given it a very different spin this time around. Guilt is something that I think goes hand in hand with shame, and that tends to come when we let ourselves down in terms of our own values, or we cause pain to others. We feel guilty about that, and guilt and shame often overlap. Anger is another great one, and anger can be a tremendous inhibition, and Gosha touched on that, and I think it's something that comes out when we're living in fear. Injustice is one of the biggest creators uh, of anger. Those of you out there who have children will know that they're born with a sense of justice. You've only got to give one child two biscuits and the other child only one biscuit, and you'll see what an injustice means for them. But when we're adult, perhaps we can link anger to disrespect or to wounded pride. And that's something that might offend our egos and also hold us back. And the final point, although there are others that I thought would be useful for you all today, is how we feel about others' material or relational success. What does that mean? When we see other people get lucky, when we do it, it's talent. When they do it, they got lucky. And also when others are popular, perhaps when we're frightened of feeling isolated or alone and we see other people seamlessly or seemingly enjoy popularity without working or without the anxiety that we may experience, we may feel envy or jealousy. All these things can hold us back, but they also inform us when we can be honest about them and open with them, we disempower them, leaving us free in the moment to experience change for the better. Next slide, please. Okay, this is a little tricky and I'm gonna try and do it at a pace, but I thought it'd be interesting for us to take a moment to look at what forgiveness is not. It is not just a pardon. It is not just condoning or excusing someone else's behavior or our own or indeed reconciliation. We can come together again, but we might not forgive. How long will the reconciliation last if we don't make an attempt at forgiveness? Justification, well, something can be justified, but if we don't believe that uh, the action uh, was fair, then we may not be able to put justification alongside forgiveness. Similarly with forgetting, um, we might leave us val um, vulnerable to the offense being committed again or the offence being felt again with us. Balancing scales. 
Oh, is that forgiveness? I think it hints at getting back at someone, which is not the same as, as forgiving. It's in the same territory as revenge. Letting time heal the wound. Forgiving is active rather than passive. Letting it go is not the same as forgiving. And the same with abandoning resentment. We can let go of the resentment, but that doesn't mean that we've forgiven. And the same as possessive positive feelings about uh, forgiveness, but not actually feeling positive towards an individual and still not forgiving them. Saying, I forgive you. You can forgive without using specific words. I forgive you doesn't mean I truly forgive someone. Making a decision to forgive, it can involve a decision, but forgiveness is a process and that can take time. It's, it starts with perhaps saying, I forgive you, and then the real work begins at that reconciliation and making things right. A quick fix. Forgiveness takes time and progress can fluctuate, and it's something that is often discussed as more mutual. Simply accepting what happens. Acceptance is, in a, big imp is a really important part of being able to operate in the present, but it's not necessarily a part of forgiveness. Acceptance, um, not all acceptance is forgiveness. It's a part of the process of forgiving. Moving on, we may have no choice. We can decide to move on without looking back and without forgiving. Saying I have the satisfaction of not letting the person get to me. It's powerful and it's a strategy, but it's not necessarily forgiveness. Letting the other person know how much they owe me is actually a form of revenge. It's using the misdeed or transgression as a weapon. Okay, I've done that at an incredible pace and I recognize that there's probably some raised eyebrows and furrowed brows in terms of what does he actually mean and what is this about? Perhaps if I come on to the next slide and explain what I believe forgiveness is. This is lifted from Enright and Fitzgibbons, um, who wrote an incredible book on resolving anger. It's available from the American Psychological Association and was published in 2000. This is wordy, but I think this just gives rise to how complex forgiveness or concepts of forgiveness is. Forgiveness is when people, upon rationally determining that they have been unfairly treated, forgive when they willfully abandon resentment and related responses to which they have a right and endeavor to respond to the wrongdoer based on the moral principle of beneficence, which may include compassion, unconditional worth, generosity, and moral love, to which the wrongdoer by nature, a nature of the hurtful act or acts has no right. I understand that that is hard to take on board at one pass. So we don't have the luxury of time to be able to reflect on this um, and for me to explain what some of the concepts embedded within it might be. But I wish only to convey that forgiveness is not as simple as saying, I forgive you. It starts with that, but then there is that process of real understanding in terms of what that means for the person who has offended us and for them hopefully to understand what our forgiveness means for them and ourselves. So this is a really big, powerful concept which I think links to change because it's really difficult to begin to change if we're holding on to something that stops us from going forward and keeps us stuck in our past. That's a massive concept, and I fully appreciate that um, as a therapist, that tends to be what therapy is about, helping people recognize what's holding them stuck and what they might need to do to be able to move forward without the hangover from the past. And forgiveness is a central part of that, in my opinion. I look forward to hearing what you think too. So with our next slide, please, I thought I'd leave the Romans and the Greeks just for this session, although there's some very powerful work from Marcus Aurelius around uh, forgiveness, and that informs modern psychotherapy and counseling. But I've taken something from the Buddhist faith, which is simply that the give forgiveness is a gift to yourself. It frees you from the past, from past experiences, and past relationships. It allows you to live in the present. 
when you forgive yourself and forgive others, you are indeed free. In short, and in relation to the other two presentations um, which we've had this afternoon, I don't believe you can embrace change when you're stuck. And forgiveness liberates your potential in response to change. And I think that was powerfully brought alive by both Colin and Dokia. And I hope that brings some meaning um, to the concepts of forgiveness in relation to change for you all this afternoon too. I've cut that very short. And my final slide welcomes your questions. And I'm hoping with the sunshine out there that I can deal with your questions and still enable people to, uh, to grab some vitamin D and, uh, and a cup of tea outside. So uh, any questions and invite anybody um, to come forward with anything that, um, that I've raised to the link with the concept. Sorry, Fergus, I've got some questions. Um, let's start with this one. And this is in the context of um, what Colin was talking about earlier. And, and as a psychotherapist, I think your best place to maybe put um, a business spin on it or, or put, put this in the context of business. So it says, what steps can you put into place to get you through the day, taking one day at a time? So Colin earlier was talking about just that rather than thinking about the end goal, um, we, we've got to put in, you know, the saying I like to, uh, to say is um, get our ducks in a row. Um, and in, if any one of those ducks are, are, are out of sync, then, then we're not going to reach our final destination. If we, can't, um, if we can't conquer step one, step two, all the way to step 10, then we're not going to achieve our, our kind of end goal. So what this person, I suppose, is asking is when our ducks are in a row, um, how do we kind of work through those stages um, and find, I suppose, inner strength, resilience, mindset to get to the, yeah. the, the, the final destination? It's a great question. And Colin gave us a really good insight. They, in that exercise, um, or the mission rather, in, um, in Bosnia, uh, they had their ducks in a row. Everything was planned. Um, but the guys they were after didn't read the plan and they didn't conform to the plan. And so the ducks all got muddled up. And uh, there's a really good example of, well, just got to keep your head and keep moving. But to answer the question more specifically, typically and from a psychodynamic um, perspective, depression has its roots in the past. Anxiety has its roots in the future. If we try and plan every minute detail of what we think might happen in the future, we can be forever planning and never actually act. So there's, there's that reasonable balance between planning enough and being comfortable with the level of planning that you have, and also content that you've learned from lessons in the past and you're not stuck in the past to be able to act in the moment. Um, if that's overly simple, then keep your horizon short. Don't worry about the end of the week and try and deal with what is facing you right now. I'm sure Colin wasn't worried about what supper was uh, in the moment that the three of them uh, in Bosnia were walking towards him on that bank. He had to be clear-minded and present at the moment. And I dare say there was a lot going on underneath his shirt at the same time. I hope that gives you something of an That's answer. Brilliant. Excellent question, thank you. Yeah, a question that was, was actually put to Colin, but we didn't have time to answer it. But again, I think you're per perfectly poised to, to answer this question. Um, have you found lockdown challenges of the last year, uh, such as isolation and uncertainty scary, or have you seen uh, easier considering what you have gone through over the years? So obviously only Colin can ask that question, but I think lockdown for many people has caused a huge, um, uh, if, if you like, a, a huge bump to, to our mental health. That doesn't mean we need to go running off to the doctors and getting uh, prescription medicine prescribed and tranquilizers and Valium and things like that just to get from day, day one to two. But I think with lockdown, um, people in general, having spoken to, to them, feel disorientated. I call it the COVID hangover. Um, as we start to come out of the other end, um, people have kind of almost got comfortable living in lockdown. And actually, it's quite scary that we're coming out of lockdown. It's almost like um, 
Absolutely. Uh, I think you've mentioned it before about how the how the um, uh, the, the, the capped whore f falls in love with their capture. Um, I mean, we have been captured. We we we've been we've been trapped in this um, ever evolving Stop cycle. Of, yeah, and, and now we're we're coming out of it. It's like, oh Christ, what do we do? How how do we how do we live our life like we used to do? Because we've been trapped for the last twelve months, um, pretty much self isolating and and only going out when absolutely necessary with a with a face mask over our uh, over our faces i think there's something um i think there's something really powerful in in a point that gosha made which was um fear of success is greater than fear of failure when we were all put into lockdown lockdown one we didn't have any option and there was actually, the weather was good. Um, for those of us with children that don't see them an awful lot, that was a bit of a privilege too. So there was some novelty and there was some stuff that was uh, new and exciting for us. We didn't expect to go through it again. One of the things that I think was really difficult, and Colin raised this with mock execution. Can you imagine a mock execution when you're gonna be executed, except you don't? I mean, that's just horrific on so many levels. So the idea, and I think a lot of people suffered at Christmas time with this idea of being able to have some form of interaction and also a new year coming. And there's a, a trick that I guess a lot of us fell for, which is a new year. It can't be the same. It's got to change. We know that change is something we can't stop. But 2021 arrived and we're still in lockdown. In actual fact, it was harder than the brief relief we had during Christmas. So that false horizon and a view to a summit further away set us back. But that was the failure that we were kind of used to of being stuck. And I think the anxiety that comes with imminent freedom, what will I do? How will it be? My advice to anybody uh, that's sitting with that and struggling a little bit is be kind to yourself, be gentle. I think, you know, just, just I mean, I, I can say this for one. I mean, speaking to a lot of people, also with my own anxieties and, and concerns about this new normal that we're, we're starting to to um, kind of you know start starting to to see you know we could all be in lockdown again this time in in, in, in a month we don't know but I think for a lot of people um, it gave by being being locked down by the government saying you must stay at home you're not allowed out the house you can't go to work it's almost a safety blanket to say, well, actually, yes. I haven't succeeded because I've been told by the government to stay at home. So how can you expect yes. me to succeed? How can you expect me to achieve my budgets and my targets if I can't work properly? You know, the only way I can meet people is online. Um, you know, and, and, and people, some people, I'm not saying every single person in the universe uh, is like this, but a lot of people I speak to, when they open up to me about their anxieties, that safety blanket hasn't just been ripped up, ripped away from them. It, it, it's just, it's disappeared. And suddenly they, what's your excuse now for not hitting budgets? You had, okay, accept well, that. I had, you had your excuse when we were forced by our government to go into lockdown, but you've got no excuse for not hitting target. So that exposes their, maybe their, their insecurities and their inabilities. There's a big point wrapped up in that is um, we can't get that time back. So don't try and restart. Don't try and catch up. Do set your sights on starting afresh. Jeremy, I yeah. saw we've got a couple of questions around yeah. forgiveness that came in. I mean, you, you can see them on your screen, so feel free to answer them. I, I, I can't. Oh, OK. Um, I can't. So, so there's, there's, and she won't mind me saying it because she's done it publicly. I've got a, a, a question here from Kay Reeve. Uh, Kay says, great talk about forgiveness. At what point would you say resentment becomes a bigger emotion, sorry, big, a bigger emotional health issue as opposed to taking time to heal? Oh, great question. Um, at what point does resentment become a bigger risk? Emotional, than so what, 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 um, what Kay's asking is, um, at what point would you say resentment becomes a bigger emotional health issue as opposed to taking time to heal okay resentment um 
becomes more and more concentrated um, over time unless we take steps to embrace what it is that we feel uh, resentful of or for. Um, and if we don't, if we try and ignore it, suppress it, keep pushing it down, then the Freudian school would say that will manifest in physical illness. Um, and so absolutely, if we don't deal with the resentment we feel, then it steals our generosity, it corrupts our joy, and ends us feel, with us feeling embittered, perhaps, which is a good word to, divide, to describe um, resentfulness. And so taking the time to heal is probably taking the time to process the anger or resentment that you feel. And if you can't do that in real time, in a place of work or whatever, then, you know, for example, if in a difficult meeting, asking to be forgiven and to take a walk around the block before you come back in because somebody said something insensitive um, is probably better than re reacting in anger and being able to respond with the absence of resentment and to be able to say how you feel is probably restorative and empowering. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I mean, that's a great, great response. Great question, great response. And, and probably time for our, our last question from Chris Bulmer. Um, I find, sorry, I find, for, sorry, let me start again. I, something else popped up. Um, I find giving forgiveness when I've been wronged very hard to do and I never forget it. What is the best way to overcome this as to lead a better life whereby I don't carry the hurt it caused with me? Oh, really good question. Again, because it's really powerful, letting go or forgiveness is much easier said than done. By the way, I am human and I am flawed. I do have some resentments. Um, I do try and process them and deal with them but I can still feel just like the next guy. Uh, when my favorite team has victory stolen, um, I can feel resentful. That's perhaps a lighter way of looking at things. But when we feel that there is something with us, then I would ask you just to question, how is this resentfulness serving me? What is it doing for me? It's not that we necessarily forget when we forgive. Indeed, sometimes we don't but it means that we are disempowering the resentment from poisoning the water in our well quite literally. And it is back to that sort of Buddhist um, quote of trying to set ourselves free. I say trying because we can't just say the magic words and the resentment disappears. It may take several attempts or run-ups. It's something we can practice. It's not, I don't believe it's a switch that we can flick and say, look, it's okay, I forgive you. We can say that, do we believe it? Can we embody that forgiveness? Probably not. So it does take exercise. You wouldn't, if you're not a runner, you wouldn't, you know, step out your front door and, and bang out five kilometers. It will really hurt you, it might even kill you. Uh, so in the same way, <laughs> try little and, and often to have a look at what that kernel of resentment is about and borrow these three existential techniques, three very simple steps. Ask yourself, what would I like to keep? What would I like to change? And what would I like to throw away from the experience that has its roots in, or where, where the, the resentment has its roots? Might be a family squabble, might be a business squabble, might be a relationship, I don't know. But we learn something when our feelings get triggered and remembering what we've learned is important, but also learning how to let go of the stuff that is not serving us that is simply the rocks in our pocket that makes us go slower. Trying to process those rocks is difficult. And I would say, and it's not a plug, but I would say, if you can find someone who isn't a friend or a relative to have an open conversation so you can say all the unreasonable and unsayable things that you may feel about the, result, the resentment that you carry, that might help to detoxify it and help you to move on to. I hope that helps. So what you've just basically outlined is the psychotherapy version of Couch 5K. <laughs> Whatever works uh, for you. They're both therapeutic. Yeah. And, and yeah, that's my brilliant. point. Get, if, you're, if you're stuck, get moving. As we said before, we think at walking pace. So just at the very least, going and having a walk can change our cognitive processes. Excellent. I hope that um, 
lovely. That that's brilliant, Fergus. Um, I, I make that bang on five o'clock. Obviously, thank you for uh, facilitating this afternoon session. Thanks very much to uh, to Colin and, and Gozio. It's really interesting um, free talks. Uh, thank you so much for joining us online. Uh, obviously, I can't see you in person, but I know you're you're there. Um, and I really appreciate the time you've given up to be here today. And I hope you got a lot from it. And I'll be in contact with you all on an individual basis. But that's that's uh, that's all from now. Um, have a lovely thank evening. You, thank everybody. you, everybody. Yeah. Thank Take you. Care.